Hi, my name is Courtney Jackson and I am a veterinarian. I have practiced veterinary medicine uh, for going on 20 years now, either part-time or full-time. I do have two small dogs, one that has pancreatitis and is the reason why I started my blog, The Pets Digest. Uh, that's Chi Chi right in the upper, in the, um, upper right corner. And then you have Cha-Cha on the left. She does actually suffers from some bouts of um, IBS from time to time. So she gets stress sickness, almost like stress colitis, what we're talking about today. And let's just jump right in. So if your dog has colitis, then you probably already know a lot of these things. Or if your dog has just um, recently gotten colitis, then you probably can gain a lot of information from this video or other videos that are on YouTube, as well as blog articles that you can read. And of course, speaking with your veterinarian. So colitis is a fairly common type of inflammatory bowel disease in dogs that usually causes just a really persistent diarrhea. And it's usually of an unknown origin. There's really no no definitive origin um, that it can be tracked to. We'll talk a little bit about that later. It can either be acute or chronic, and most of the dogs that are affected are of middle age. So the large bowel, the large intestine, is what helps to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance, and it also serves to absorb nutrients and store feces until the feces is excreted. So oftentimes when the colon is damaged or infiltrated by bacteria, parasites, or fungi, that can cause inflammation in your dog's large intestine and they'll get diarrhea. And so colitis is a common disease, like we said, that is really characterized by persistent diarrhea and any type of itis, as in colitis, means inflammation. So therefore, colitis is basically the inflammation of the colon or large bowel. And like I said before, it can either be acute or chronic. The one we'll really focus on today will be chronic diarrhea or chronic colitis. And chronic colitis is defined as having inflammation of the colon for two weeks or more. And it's usually split into four different types, and they are really dependent on the type of cells that are invading the intestinal mucosa. So you can have lymphocytic, plasmacytic, plasmacytic, eosinophilic, neutrophilic, or granulomatous, which is pretty rare, except it's seen in young boxers and French bulldogs. So they are usually, if you're going to see the granulomatous type, then it's usually going to be in one of those two breeds. Treating it is usually starting, most vets will start NPO, which means nothing per os, which means nothing in the mouth for at least 12 to 24 hours. Some vets are moving away from doing this and feeding a little bit more and just feeding frequently um, after they've noticed the symptoms, but most vets still do the NPO for 12 to 24 hours at least. And then a lot of times the symptoms, they will come and go even with that. Um, but sometimes they'll become even more free, more frequently um, and more consistent. So these are usually the symptoms and the signs that you'll see. So you'll see, like I said before, of course, uncontrollable diarrhea. Your dog may have some abdominal pain, so they may walk hunched over or if you pick them up, they may yelp out in, in pain. If you touch their stomachs, um, they may have some pain or straining when defecating. And there may be some mucus or blood in the diarrhea. The last two, the severe weight loss and the vomiting, are actually pretty rare and are usually only seen if the colitis is left untreated. So what causes colitis? Like I said before, there really is no definitive diagnosis as far as to what causes colitis. It can be an infection, so bacterial, parasit, par, bac, bacterial. So it can be an infection, 
a bacteria, a parasite, a fungus, um, a traumatic injury can cause it sometimes, or it has been noted to um, to be in conjunction with maybe one of the other issues that the dog may be having. Allergies have often been um, thought of as causing colitis in dogs and genetics. Sometimes some breeds are just genetically predisposed to developing colitis or some types of colitis. Like we said before, the French bulldogs may get granny llamas hiss. Also stress. So a lot of dogs can have stress colitis. And like my dog, Cha-Cha, I notice if she gets extremely stressed, it's only happened maybe twice in her life, but she'll have bloody diarrhea um, when that happens to her. Again, most of the dogs are middle-aged and there actually is no sex predilection. So it can be male or female that you'll see it in. And diagnosing it, it's usually trying to figure out what it is not. So what you're going to do is usually your vet will diagnose in steps and they'll want to take a history, clinical signs, and you know, you they'll want to know if your dog maybe has eaten any possible foods that they're not used to. Has there been a change in their diet? Have you been traveling? What type of food are they on? Did you switch the food? So those are questions that your vet will probably have. And they're probably going to be good to have written down before you go into your vet's clinic. Um, just because you'll know they'll probably ask those questions. Also, of course, they'll do a physical exam. They may want to do a rectal palpation just to check for any abnormal masses or polyps or things like that or blood. And they also may want to do a fecal. And most vets will. So I would say your best bet is to write down all these things, as much information as you can. So then when you get into the vet clinic, you don't have to worry about trying to remember what type of food does your dog eat? Um, did they switch? Did you switch the food and what did you switch it to? Those type of simple things that you can already have on hand before you leave the house for your appointment. Also, what you may want to do is bring in a fecal sample. So I always tell patients when you bring in a fecal sample, make sure it's fresh. So ideally it should be from that day. If you can get it right before you go into the vet clinic, that's even better. Uh, another step that your vet may want to do after the fecal and the initial steps uh, is blood work, maybe a blood work in your analysis, just to kind of rule out any other types of um, any, anything else that may be causing the diarrhea. And a lot of times these tests are normal with colitis, unless you may see an increase in the types of cells that are elevated in your in your dog's colon. So remember we were saying that sometimes you may see an invasion of a specific type of cell. So eosinophils may be elevated and that may con be contributing to the type of cells that are, are in the colon and in the CBC or the blood work that your dog will get. The next step beyond that, of course, would be something like x-ray or ultrasound just to kind of see what's going on in the stomach prior to actually doing like a colonoscopy um, and actually going in and taking samples or photos of what's going on in your dog's intestine. So if your dog has chronic colitis, usually they'll have some relapses and it usually doesn't go away, unfortunately. Um, like I said, my dog has only had two, so they don't have to be often, but they can come back um, with chronic colitis. And so the treatment would be just to treat any type of infectious diseases and that your, your vet may have found with all the testing, because basically, like I said before, you're just trying to find out what is what it is not. So you're just trying to rule out anything else that the diarrhea possibly could be. And then you're settling on, okay, it's, it's colitis. Your vet also may want to do a dietary trial where your dog changes it, their food to something that's a lot blander or maybe like a novel protein. So uh, my dog is on Royal Canin um, gastrointestinal diet both of them are actually because, like I said, one has pancreatitis and then the other one has IBS. So they eat a pretty bland diet, but I also cook for them 
and I have some recipes and things like that on my website. So I try to, you know, give them a bland diet, but also give them a little variety so they don't get bored with it. And with a dietary trial, if your vet decides to put you on a prescription diet, your dog on the, not you, but your dog on a prescription diet, just know that they can be a little costly, um, but they are worth it if your vet decides to do that. Otherwise, they may just say try a novel protein or try a hydrolyzed diet, which is basically when um, the proteins are broken down so small that your body doesn't, that your dog's body won't recognize it as an intruder and it won't try to attack, basically. Um, if your, I don't think, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but sometimes colitis can be attributed to an autoimmune issue so basically your dog's body is attacking itself and if that's the if that's the case then your dog may be put on immunosuppress immunosuppressive drugs as well and also some anti-inflammatories they usually work pretty well in treating any existing infections and just um helping your dog to feel better so I don't know if you've ever heard about like steroids just automatically make you feel better, which is usually the case unless it's an issue where the steroids are going to suppress your dog's immune system even more further, which is not great. So that's why um, a lot of vets won't just run to steroids or NSAIDs um, prior to trying every anything else. And also, some of the research has shown that increasing your dog's fiber may help improve your dog's diarrhea. So a lot of vets will tell, tell pet owners to add a little bit of pumpkin to your dog's food or even Metamucil, which is fine for dogs, um, given in a dose very specific for your dog's weight. So speak with your vet about that if you're going to start them on something with more fiber. And you don't necessarily want to do that super long term. So you'll want to talk with your vet about how long you know, your dog should be on any added fiber. And I have heard as a vet, I've, I honestly never prescribed with a slippery elm. I've heard a lot of, um, a lot of pet owners have had a lot of luck with that, with their, their dog, they have colitis. So slippery elm and probiotics. I do actually feed my own dog probiotics and they do well with them and pre and probiotics because dogs do have GI bacteria just like we do, good and bad. And it helps a lot of times to increase the good bacteria that they have in their guts. Also, your vet will probably try metronidazole or something similar like Tylosin um, to kind of help combat any like micro anti any micro microbes or microbial uh, infections that your dog may have as well. Something else that I found that was really interesting that I actually never have done in practice is FMT, so fecal transfer. And if you if you have ever heard of it, it's really it's been around for a while, but it's a really novel train of thought to a lot of vets, as far as I know. But it's basically taking feces from another dog, a healthy dog, and transferring it into the dog with colitis because uh, the microbial um, makeup of the, the healthy dog will kind of be transferred into the dog with colitis and it will help their microbes. So it's called a fecal microbiota transplantation and they do it apparently in humans a lot. So <laughs> that was news to me. Um, surgery. Surgery is usually saved as a last resort in most cases because it is the most invasive method of treatment. Just like in humans with Crohn's disease, which this, if it's an auto, autoimmune disease in your dog, this can be almost quite similar to Crohn's disease in humans. So surgery is usually the last option in humans as well. So what do you feed a dog with colitis? Long term, if your dog has chronic colitis, then you'll want a food that's really low residue, that's hypoallergenic, and that is highly digestible. 
So low residue foods are usually highly digestible anyway. So you'll want to talk with your vet about a really good diet. Um, a lot of a lot of pet owners decide to actually cook for their dogs themselves, which is fine. But a lot of them find much luck with switching to a new protein. So basically, if your dog has been eating chicken and beef, they may do well on uh, bison and lamb, something that they've never had before and that's new to them. Also, low residue foods, it just basically means that everything is pretty much uh, metabolized by the body during digestion. A lot of the foods that are on the shelves the dog's body has to do a lot to digest it. And the low residue foods, they don't have to do quite as much to get it through their systems and to digest it. You'll also want to do a low fat bland diet, at least initially. So I do have on my website an entire article about feeding your dog a bland diet, like what to feed them, white rice, boiled white rice, um, boil, you know, chicken, shredded chicken breast, things like that, that may help you out a little bit when trying to figure out what to feed them, if you're going to feed them a bland diet. And then again, the, the foods that you, you choose should be, they shouldn't upset the dog's stomach more. So that's why you want to choose a bland diet or like a hydrolyzed protein, um, hydrolyzed diet, and a lot of times these are really helpful in the short term and then owners will switch their dog back to their regular food later on. So if your dog does well with that, the short term prognosis is usually pretty good. Um, like I said, although dogs may, they may relapse over time again. Um, and most dogs do respond really well to the dietary changes. So that, in my mind, makes me think that a lot of it is due to allergies and foods, which is one of the primary reasons, um, the primary diagnoses that you see with colitis, too. So I'm just going to summarize everything we talked about. So colitis is a form of IBD in dogs that, pre that presents with persistent diarrhea, and usually dietary modification is necessary to treat, um, starting with a bland diet. And dogs usually respond pretty well to the dietary changes once they're placed on medication uh, many times as well. And surgery is always a last resort in most cases. The short-term prognosis is usually fairly good with most dogs, but many dogs do relapse over time. So if you want more information about colitis or any other um, GI disease with dogs and feeding them, that's what my website, The Pets Digest, is all about. And I hope that you will subscribe and like this video. Thanks. Bye.